Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, part two of mat training. If you weren't with us last week, we talked about how to supercharge your mat, make it um, a very valuable place for your dog to be. Um, you can find that video on our blog, and I'll link it um, in this recording or underneath this recording later if you didn't see it. It's also on the Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So last week, we just talked about introducing the mat. Um, how to get your how to get your dog onto it, and then how to make it more likely they get onto it in the future and build a little bit of duration so they're actually staying on the mat. That's usually a more useful behavior if you're wanting to use mat work or settle uh, around your dog's triggers or anytime your dog is doing something you don't particularly like and you think that settling on a mat would be better. Uh, all right, so today we are going to talk about adding distractions. So that even if stuff is going on around your dog, and it usually is when you want them to not be jumping around on people or barking or whatever it is they do, um, they'll still stay on their mat. All right, so I'm going to jump into some slides. Oh, um, as a reminder, especially if you're here for the first time with us, if you comment or ask a question um, underneath the video on Facebook or YouTube, the, it'll pop up for me. It'll take a little, a couple seconds, but I'm happy to take questions at any time. So go ahead and enter your questions as you have them. All right. So the, we came to this series, we came to mat training as part of this series on building confidence in fearful dogs. And I'm going to cover the reasons for this because I know not everyone has been with us every week. Everyone wants to build confidence in their fearful dog, right? Um, it's a good goal. We hate to see our dogs suffering or worrying about things. We want them to enjoy life. But confidence is really kind of a label. How do we define it? How do we train it? And so our free Facebook group, which uh, some of you are in, came up with a list of ways or behaviors their dog does that tells them, or at least they think, that it, these behaviors mean their dog is feeling confident. So there are quite a few here, and these are also given in the last few sessions. One of them was lying down, relaxing, um, instead of hiding or shaking. So a settled behavior. So that's what we're working on today. As a reminder, you can reinforce behaviors, but you can't reinforce confidence. That's why we're focusing on behaviors that you can see and reinforce in this series. I recommend using positive reinforcement. You could, there are, you know, there's more than one kind of reinforcement you can use in training. Positive reinforcement is the kind where your dog gets something that they like or want after doing a behavior, and then it, that increases the frequency or likelihood of the behavior in the future. We also can get some positive associations as a side effect of this kind of training. So you may have noticed this if you do any training with food or toys already, and anything that signals to your dog that's about to happen, like maybe you arrive at the place where your dog has class or you put on your treat bag, your dog gets all happy and excited. Um, there have been some positive associations made there. And that's what we would like for our fearful dogs. Um, so, right. So just to reiterate, we've decided in this series, at least, and if you have other ideas and you'd like to share, I'd love to hear them, that building confidence Practically speaking, from the point of view of a dog trainer or those of you working with your dogs, um, a good working definition or at least a way to implement this is to use positive reinforcement to train behaviors that we would like to see in a quote unquote confident dog. All right, getting to settle. Usually when I do settle or teach um, kind of a lie down behavior, I use a target like a mat. And I showed you a bit about this this last week. And we talked about supercharging the mat, which is just a, to me, a catchy word that means pair it with reinforcement a lot. Reinforce your dog looking at it, sniffing it, sniffing it, being on it. Um, like I said, we have several videos showing you how to do that from last week. This week, we are in the second part where we're going to talk about kind of making it stick that your dog being on the mat, just because something interesting is happening in the environment, um, we still want to make it worth your while, worth your dog's while to stay on their mat. And then if we have time, which I think we will, we'll talk a little bit about how to then start using that mat training around your dog's 
triggers, which is usually just shorthand for the things that um, to which your dog responds negatively. So the situations in which your dog right now has um, is showing some problem behavior. Uh, okay, we have a comment that my boy Ned is frightened of the mat. Poor pup. Um, Charlie, I don't know if Charlie is your name, um, just your Facebook name, but does Ned, um, are there any other resting spots your dog likes? Does, uh, does Ned like, um, like dog beds or have you tried some different types of mats? Does he walk over floor mats that are just in the house? Um, identifying something that he's already comfortable with might be a good place to start. All right, I'll keep an eye on that and come back to it. Um, Pancake was also afraid of the mat the first time I put it down. So I just kind of put it out of the way, put some treats near it and kind of around it and then left the room. <laughs> and eventually he stopped paying attention to it. That doesn't always work though. Okay, he loves being on the couch. Okay, so the couch... Um, Sorry, I'm answering questions right now. I don't know if everyone can see these or if only I can see the comments. Um, so if he likes being on the couch, you could start with that if you need this subtle behavior in the house. Obviously, the couch isn't very um, portable. So, so if you wanted the subtle behavior to work in other rooms um, or outside the house, then you might need to... Um, like need to kind of figure something out there. One thing you could try if he hangs out on the couch a lot is see if you could get him to settle on, say he's afraid of the mat, maybe try a folded up towel or blanket that's kind of the size of a mat and see if he'll lie down on that on the couch. And then you can migrate that down to the floor. It might be a good starting place for him. Okay, if you are gonna start to add distractions, um, to your mat training. And if you followed along with last week's training, you should be ready to at least start adding some little distractions. We're gonna start small and very frequently reinforce. R plus means positive reinforcement. Um, let's see if I have, I do have some more slides. Okay, so we're gonna start small, nothing, you're not gonna go straight from, oh, I supercharged the mat, my dog kind of likes the mat, and now I'm gonna try to get him to stay on the mat when the doorbell rings or something. <laughs> um, if anyone has tried this, you already know, for most dogs, it's gonna blow their minds. So we're gonna start with little distractions and I'll give you some video examples and reinforce very frequently, like every few seconds, even every one to two seconds, if that's what your dog needs in the moment. I like to incorporate a lot of real life distractions, even in early training. This can help your dog generalize this settle on the mat behavior to lots of different situations, at least in the house, if you're doing this training in the house. You're gonna use a wide variety of distractions. Again, helps generalize the behavior. So it's not, um, your dog can't just do it in one specific situation. Like, you know, your training setup, they can do it fine and everywhere else they can't. This will help guard against that a little bit. So let's start by looking at small distractions. What, is it, what does it mean to have a small distraction? Well, of course, <laughs> there's no easy answer, right? It depends on your dog, but there are some things that are, have, I've noticed, and many trainers I think have, noticed to be common across many dogs, not all dogs, but many dogs. Often if you stay near the mat, and of course this doesn't apply if your dog is afraid of you, <laughs> if you stay near the mat, um, oops, sorry, I'm going to try to get my, um, someone let me know if you have a chance if my volume is okay, my microphone is kind of far from my face. Um, for many dogs, unless they're afraid of you, if you're staying near the mat, that's easier for them to stay on the mat as well than if you move away. So early on, don't go too far away from the mat when you're adding distractions. Um, if you're going to move around or do any kind of movements, slower and smaller movements are usually easier for your dog to um, to resist, you know, to stay on the mat during than if you're, you know, jumping around, running around, move. Um, doing anything quickly. All right, so let's first take a look at some video examples of small distractions um, with frequent treats, frequent positive reinforcement. All right, so here's little Coco. Well, not so little, I guess. Um, Mom's sending her to her bed here. 
And then she's going to incorporate some somewhat small distractions. These, by the way, these are examples, but they might still be too tough um, for your dog, depending on how much training you've already done. If that's the case, just scale them back. So here she sends Coco to her bed. Now she's staying pretty close to the mat like we talked about. Just does, you know, put something away in a drawer, kind of a normal everyday activity, and then gives her a treat. So it's not very long between her, you know, between treats if she's doing these short nearby distractions. Here's another example. She goes to her bed. Mom's going to open a drawer, take something out. So this is a little bit longer of a delay to get the treat. She's still nearby and fairly small movements. Sitting nearby reading. So here she's not moving at all. But because she's not moving, she can maybe wait a little longer to give the treat because um, it might be an easier distraction for her. This is another way to um, make headway if you have multiple people in the house. Here, Chris is walking around, so doing kind of more movement than Rachel had been doing in the earlier steps. But you see Rachel is sitting right next to the mat and can give very frequent treats that way. Um, and that's something I often do when I'm moving into a more difficult step for a dog that involves someone else or you know other people or other dogs in the environment. I'll start close and ref and reinforce very frequently. Okay, and like I said, I'll show you, um, give you some more ideas about this. You want to use real life distractions and a wide variety of them. Um, so, and I didn't tell Rachel what to do in these videos. She's just creative. <laughs> Here she's playing the piano. Um, looking through books or I don't know, DVDs or something. Here Chris is gonna walk across the room, sit down and play a guitar. Uh, folding laundry can be a good one, especially because you can do it right next to the mat or kind of inch it out a little farther and also makes it fit into your day. Opening and closing windows. And because we're still in early training in this video, treats are coming pretty frequently. All right. Does anyone have questions about those first small distractions with frequent reinforcement before we look at making it more difficult? Oops, sorry, this is at the end. All right. Now, how are we going to make it tougher? We just looked at some little distractions. What things can we do to start to move forward in the training? Uh, one, move farther away. We talked about how being closer to the mat makes it easier for your dog. So if you start to move farther away during the training repetitions between treats, that's one way to increase difficulty for many dogs. Faster movement. Also, many dogs find fast movement either concerning or exciting, so it can be uh, a tougher distraction for them. More enticing distractions. So that depends on your dog, but something your dog likes or would normally want to go toward. Incorporate some of those. And stretch out the time between treats or whatever reinforcer you're using. You may be using belly rubs or uh, a favorite toy, whatever. But um, you can stretch out the interval between treats as you become your dog becomes more advanced in this training. And if you can, at least early on, I would recommend increasing just one of these sort of parameters, one of these aspects of the training, making only one more difficult at a time. And sometimes you'll even have to make another one easier than you had it previously in training um, because it'll be too tough for your dog. So you wouldn't want to add fast movement and move really far away from your dog at the same time if you haven't done either of those separately. All right, let's take it, take a look at moving farther away. Just a couple examples. All right, so this is me in my kitchen. That's Pancake on his mat. Um, something I wanted to point out here, I think I mentioned it last week, is that he is getting his reinforcers, or what I, I'm pretty sure appear to be acting as reinforcers, his treats, 
from a snuffle mat. And the reason I like to do this at this stage of training, I was just starting to add more movement farther away from the mat. Um, and putting the treats in the mat allowed me to still have his, his rate of reinforcement, the frequency of treats be high, even though I wasn't coming back to the mat quite as frequently. Cause I, you know, if you walk farther away, that just by default means that the, if you're hand delivering treats, the treats are going to be farther apart in time, more spaced out, unless you use something like a snuffle mat. So this allowed me to keep his reinforcement rate high while still being able to move around a bit more. And for him, I don't care if he's lying down or standing or whatever. So I'm leaving the room. I'm doing cleaning, I think, just walking around doing some straightening up. Pop a couple of treats into his snuffle mat. In theory, you could do the same thing with a chew or a Kong, but in my experience, the snuffle mat is slightly less likely to get picked up and carried off the mat, <laughs> at least with my dogs. So that's one idea. All right. So that was an example of just starting to move farther away from the mat. You can do some fast movement um, here for the sake of training video. <laughs> Rachel is doing jumping jacks and running around, but staying close to the mat, right? Because if we're going to increase speed, we don't want to increase distance at the same time. And still giving the treat pretty, pretty soon after she starts that distraction. More enticing distractions. Let's look at what we've got for Coco as an example. Coco's really into toys. So here Rachel is bouncing a ball. That was pretty good for Coco. So that's a nice example of that. Longer intervals between treats. This is going to be a little bit more advanced. So Rachel is sitting pretty close by, so that may decrease the difficulty a little bit, which is good because she's going to have the treats be somewhat far apart in time. All right. Let me stop this. All right. And I would really recommend as you get to these more difficult distractions where you're leaving the room, moving around more, the treats are several seconds, or, you know, to many, many seconds apart. It's not a bad idea to intersperse easy and difficult repetitions. So for instance, long and short intervals, you wouldn't want to do a whole bunch of long intervals in a row necessarily. I mean, if your dog can do it, that's okay. But at some point, the payoff for some dogs becomes not worth the amount of time they have to wait for it. So you could do some long stays and then, you know, do some short ones where they get the treats pretty close together to keep them engaged and keep that rate of reinforcement high. You can intersperse fast and slow movements and also boring and exciting distractions. So I think I have an example kind of here. Okay, so here Rachel's just walking around slowly, staying relatively close, but there are several seconds in between treats there. Now she's going to move a little farther away, be, you know, handling some items, move something around. Moving away again. And for a lot of dogs, when you turn your back on them and move away, that's when they get up. So just keep that in mind as a difficulty factor here. She's doing a couple trips back and forth in front of Coco, which is a more difficult challenge for many dogs. And then she's going to sit down close to her, which is an easier one. Um, right after she did that longer one where she was pacing back and forth, moving things back and forth in front of her. All right. Excellent. Okay. Any questions about increasing difficulty of your distractions? All right. So use those real life distractions and just, you know, make them a little harder using these, um, the sort of parameters we talked about, like speed of movement, distance, um, how close together your treats are in time. And you may have other things that you need to incorporate into your training, depending on your dog and your setup. All right. Um, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about triggers. Now, 
every dog has different sort of quote unquote triggers for, um, for aggressive or fearful behavior. And I'm starting to wonder if I should use a different word because triggers makes it sound like the whatever comes before the behavior is what makes it happen. But really, um, it's the whole package that makes that keeps an aggressive or fearful behavior alive. The what we call a trigger, the thing that comes before the behavior tells your dog that that fearful or aggressive behavior you've used in the past will be reinforced or is likely to be in reinforced now. But then you still need that reinforcement that comes after the behavior to keep keep the behavior going to to maintain it. So just something to clear up and I'll think about whether there's a better word I can use that's still user friendly than triggers. So but how do we add the problem scenarios, which isn't very user friendly either, the problem scenarios to your mat training? Well, just like you did with distractions, you're going to want to break it down into small pieces, as small as you can in the beginning. So break the trigger down. Very high rate of reinforcement early on. And for those of you who have dogs who have exhibited uh, aggressive behavior, even if they haven't bitten anyone, any aggressive behavior toward people or dogs, and this is where you want to try some mat training, please have one or more safety measures in place during this training. And I'll show you some examples of that. All right, let's take a look at breaking it down with high rate of reinforcement. So around triggers. Okay, so this example, this video is a little bit grainy, but um, this is Pancake, or you'll see Pancake in a second. And one of his triggers is my mother-in-law moving around in the kitchen. So after doing a bunch of the training I just showed you without mother-in-law in the picture, here we're starting with her sitting down. She's in that black chair in the middle of the screen because that was an easy, that was a way I could get him into the kitchen to his mat without him barking. So here he's following me out of another room. I go all the way to the mat. I don't try to send him from a distance. And I reward him right away. And then we stayed there. I didn't, this video is getting pretty long, but I stayed there for a while with her sitting and then we left the room again before she got up. Now in this video, we're starting to add her movement. Because we're adding her moving around the kitchen, which is one of his triggers um, where he can sometimes respond quite aggressively. I am staying right next to his mat. He's got the snuffle mat there, which means the rate of reinforcement will be high. Plus I am delivering treats very frequently. So here he notices, oh, she's coming in. I say, okay, go to your mat then. And I toss some treats onto there. I think I even drop treats as a lure. And even if your dog doesn't need a food lure to get on his mat anymore, outside of problem scenarios, it's okay to go back to it if you need to in the moment. So by staying right near him, I can adjust um, the rate of reinforcement and give additional prompts, you know, food lures, talking to him if I need to. Um, and then as we proceed in this training, you know, I'll start to back away a bit, space out his treats, and grandma or <laughs> my mother-in-law will start to um, be delivering more of the treats as well so that it works also when we're not home. All right, any questions on this little pancakes little training setup? <clears throat> Okay, so one um, situation in which a lot of people want to use mat training is for um, people coming to the door, or coming in, or just deliveries, whatever. Um, so I'll show you a few steps that we worked on with some dogs that we do day training with, or we used to. They're kind of growing up now. Um, okay, so here are brothers, Hoodie and Grizz, over here on their bed. And they've already done the basic training. They know how to go to their dog bed. Um, on a cue from a distance. And now we're adding stay settled, even if someone's going to the door. So what does this look like? Well, for them, one of the first steps is me just touching. See, I just touched and turned the doorknob and then walk back over right away and give them a treat. After that was easy for them, I didn't just do that once, I did it a few times. Crack the door, you see they perked up quite a bit there. No one's outside, I'm just working with the door here. Here, Rachel is going to open the door a bit more for a couple seconds.
and they're always getting reinforced right away right now. Not a lot of duration. Here I'm going to, there were a few steps in between here, but I'm going out and coming back in right away. So still keeping it short, but adding more action at the door. Here, I believe there is someone outside the door that's going to just say hi to Rachel, and then they're closing it. So they hear that there's someone outside the door. And then eventually we added more talking at the door, someone handing over a pretend package, that kind of thing, and knocking as well. So all those little pieces, the touching the doorknob, um, the opening of the door, having someone actually outside the door, having someone knock on the door, or use the door, use the doorbell, someone there handing you a package. If if you're working on deliveries, those are all pieces that you can um, break this training down into and just do one at a time. All right, safety backup. So this is really important. Um, if you send your dog to the mat, even if their behavior is pretty pretty good, like they're pretty good at going to the mat and staying there. Unless you have a physical restraint or barrier in place, they could still potentially bite someone. And if you're using this with visitors or strangers, um, I would strongly recommend having a way to prevent that from happening. So Coco, again, is going to start in these next videos, giving you some examples. Um, this is a three panel baby gate, which I like for doorways or wider openings. And Rachel is showing how she has her bed, Coco's bed, which is the thing she's using for mat training, on the other side of the baby gate from the front door. And then she can go to the front door, let Chris in. And then come back over and say, okay, can you get onto your mat? There's some treats there. And then for visiting... See, she has the gate set up and she and her visitor are on the other side of the gate with mom sitting right next to the gate so she can keep delivering treats on the mat easily. Um, and this is can for some dogs be a good way to start with having people in the house. You can also add um, a visual barrier on top of this baby gate, like a blanket or something or a sheet. For some fearful dogs, that makes it easier for them too, while still allowing you to stay close. And this is also helpful if you have a dog who does not do well being separated from you. So, you know, if you, some of you have seen the Zen Zone uh, handout we have for having visitors come over, that's um, here, I'll put it in the comments. It's ughindtraining.com slash Zen Zone. Make sure that's correct before I send everyone there. Yeah. Okay. I just put that in the comments. Um, that's a freebie. It has a um, PDF with links to videos demonstrating ways to set up a safe zone for your fearful or aggressive dog when visitors come over. Um, let me get this. Okay. So that is, uh, if you can just put your dog in another room, for some people that just is fine. That works for them and they don't feel the need. If they don't have a ton of visitors, they don't feel the need for their dog to ha be around strangers in the house. But if you have a dog who cannot be put away without freaking out, they have some you know, separation distress or whatever, this can be another option. You know, Set up a barrier where you can be near your dog, um, but they're still prevented from getting to the visitor. Another way that you can have um, sort of a safety measure in place is, um, I think the next video is using a leash. Yeah. So here, Rachel's opening the door, has Coco on a leash and is bringing her away from the door. And you could have a, you could combine these. You could have a baby gate at the door plus use the leash as double protection. If you have a big, strong dog you're worried about, she brings Coco over to the side so her visitor can come in and sit down and then Rachel has the bed or the mat set up next to where she's going to be sitting and she's going to be able to easily reinforce Coco at a high rate for hanging out with her and settling down while she talks to her visitor. Now, for a, you cannot start here for most dogs. Um, you can't start that close. Many dogs cannot start this close to a visitor. So you may need to start with um, just way more distance within the room or using that baby gate with maybe a blanket over it or something. So there's um, 
more of that buffer, like the visual barrier where your dog can kind of hide behind it, you're probably going to need to experiment a little bit. And this is something that, um, you know, a good positive reinforcement dog trainer can help you troubleshoot and kind of come up with the best, best way to do this. But this is just another application of mat training um, for fearful or aggressive dogs. All righty. Here is uh, the link to our free support group if you're not already in it. Facebook.com slash groups slash dog kind support. Very nice group of people in there, all struggling with probably the same issues you're struggling with if you're in our audience. And um, so check that out. We also have our training membership and our online reactive dog uh, class, which is now on demand and self paced. And the links are available on the um, underneath, I believe, underneath this video or above this video. All right. Does anyone have any questions you would like to um, cover about mat training for your own dog? Okay, here we go. All right. If there aren't any more questions, um, I'll sign off for this week. But I hope everyone has a great week. Um, I think next week we'll work on um, probably eye contact and attention. Until then, if you have any questions or if you're watching this as a recording and you have questions, just put your comments or questions underneath the video and um, I should get an alert and I can answer them. If you want to email us, our email is admin, A-D-M-I-N, at dogkindtraining.com and we're happy to help that way as well. All right, everyone, have a great week. I will see you next week.